Before we get started, I want to offer you a free vacation. This is related to my business where I help other businesses reduce their contract related costs. If you are a decision maker at a medium or enterprise business, then I want to talk with you to see about how we can address your contract costs and drive savings. If you know somebody who's a business decision maker, then I would like you to help me get in contact with them. In exchange, I am going to give you an absolutely free vacation at one of 30 places across the United States with no obligation and no timeshare pitch. The value of this offer, depending on how much savings we achieve, can literally be between thousands and millions. Please go to offer.terminalvalue.biz right now and let me know a little bit of information about your business so I can get your free vacation set up right away. Hey, welcome to Terminal Value. So everything that I do here is based on one big question, and that is how do growth-oriented people overcome the psychotic vortex of society to create a life of value and meaning? That is the question, and I am here to bring you the answer. My name is Doug Utberg, and this is Terminal Value. I publish new content every week So make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications and then share your thoughts on each episode through social media and make sure to tag me so that I will know what to create for you. We have Hans Sperling with us today and what we're going to be talking about is the secrets to intelligently growing your business through acquisition. And uh, Hans is an attorney out of Southern California and although I'm not going to hold that against him. Because as he told me in the pre-show, he does not do litigation. So I'm like, okay, so he is the helping business attorney. And so we're going to listen to him a little bit. But the idea that we wanted to talk about is how in a lot of cases, it can actually be advantageous for businesses to grow by buying other businesses as opposed to starting new segments out from scratch. But whenever you do that, there are going to be uh, legal and regulatory ramifications depending on the size of the acquisition. And that's one of the things we want to talk through today. But anyway, enough from me. Hans, introduce yourself. Yeah, so Hans Sperling, but I call myself a deals lawyer. I help business people, usually small and medium-sized businesses, Mm -hmm. although I have represented larger companies, do their business deals. Mm -hmm. Could be like we're talking about mergers and acquisitions, could be their more day-to-day commercial agreements. Um, And basically, I try to steer them through that and make them come out as successfully as possible for my client. Gotcha. All right. Well, Let's do this Harvard Business Review case study style. So, okay, let's say that I have, I don't know, we'll say a about a $30 million per year revenue manufacturing company that, you know, has about say 112 headcount, right? You know, very, very kind of small, medium business type of profile. And what I'm looking to do is say like, you know, I'm looking to you know, expand distribution or put on another line or something like that. Walk me through some of the pros and cons of the, you know, back in my finance days, I called the build versus buy analysis. And what mm-hmm. some of those, you know, some of these factors are that you see kind of from your legal perspective, because I spent a lot of my career as a spreadsheet jockey. So, you know, what I'll be looking at is the relative cost assumptions that usually tend to be pretty high level. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, obviously, and, and this is maybe more in the business end, but you, when you acquire a company and grow that way, you can do it very quickly, assuming yeah. that you can set up the financing, whereas the kind of organic growth takes a lot more time. Of course, you can access new markets very quickly by Mm -hmm. acquiring. But from a legal perspective, is what really jumps out at me is the risk. Uh, You buy a company, you know, you're buying a lot of its baggage along with it. Uh Uh, You know, companies have baggage, (laughs) (laughs) right? Exactly. And you know, there's things that we do to try to mitigate that. Obviously, that's a lot of what my focus is. But there's a limit, and obviously. The seller is supposed to disclose everything. And obviously, a lot of what we do in the contract and what we call due diligence, that Mm -hmm. process of going through, in our case, their legal documents, usually have accountants do the um, financial due diligence, go through their books. But there's a limit. You know, they obviously, if there's something negative or or several things negative, they they try to hide it. First question is, you know, why are they selling it to start with? Mm -hmm. There might be a very good reason, but they might be selling it because they think that that's about to tank. And they want to unload it while they can still get something for it. I would say there's another aspect of due diligence that doesn't get enough focus. I've never heard anyone have a term for it, but I call it operational due diligence. And that's really 
not the accountants, not the lawyers, maybe working together, but basically the business people, the buyer going in and really kicking the tires, looking under yeah. the hood, meeting the employees to the extent that you can you know, interview them, going to the offices, going to the facilities if they have them to really get a feel, is this what it appears to be? Yeah. I remember slightly different context, but years ago, I heard a story of someone involved in a ship finance, a shipbuilding deal. And for some reason, the junior lawyer actually took it in their mind to drive down to the shipyard and mm-hmm. take a look at the ship being built and discovered that the ship wasn't anywhere near where it was supposed to be in terms of the construction. And that's a huge problem. You know, It's like a, a skyscraper level yeah. construction. So- Anything like that that can be done. And of course, like I say, you know, good thing to let the law- your lawyer who's representing you know that you know, you're doing that, you're comfortable with that. But that's a really good way to catch stuff that then you know, maybe you ask your lawyer, well, does this make sense? Like, I was over there talking, you know, what about this and what about that? Any information that can get that way is always really helpful. Yeah, well, and just kind of thinking from a strategy perspective, I'd be interested to get your take on this, but from a strategy perspective, what I would also think would be potentially be a really viable strategy would be if you're buying another company for their customers. I mean, because like I know in the tech space, pretty much every enterprise resource planning and customer relationship management company, almost every acquisition that happens in that space is somebody buying somebody else's customer lists. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like how, you know, in the CRM space, what'll happen is, you know, it's kind of the big dogs there, you know, are going to be HubSpot and Salesforce with, you know, of course, SAP and Oracle kind of have their semi-competitive products, you know, but they're the big standalone CRMs. And you have a couple of other ones where you'll have all these little CRMs that'll pop up. And then they'll just start getting bought up by the, the big dogs. And these other little mm-hmm. ones will pop up and they keep getting bought up. So you'd be saying, well, okay, but they already have a product. Why do they need to buy this other company? They don't care about the other company's product. They care about their customers. They're buying their list. That's the only thing they're buying. So the second they buy them, they basically take all their IP and they just throw it out the window. They might keep a, take a few of their engineers on staff, but you know they don't care about the intellectual property. They don't care about the tech. They're just buying the customers. I don't know how often you see something like that, but I would imagine that could also be a factor too. Definitely could be. I haven't seen it so much. Always the customers are critical, even if that's not the main focus because that's your revenue. Mm -hmm. I say always, there will be cases where they want the intellectual property. Like that's what they're after. Or that, yeah, and it could be the other way around too, where you're just mm -hmm. buying the IP and you're not as concerned about all the other stuff because like say the offices, all that kind of stuff, you're going to be fire sailing off all those assets anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. It all just depends what the buyer is after. Usually the deals I've been in, they kind of want the whole package. Yeah. Uh, Maybe a little more this, a little more that. But in a case where there's um, something that is really the focus of the acquisition, that's really the the, the, the asset that they're after, Uh that would be something I would really want to know from the client. Because otherwise I'm going to, in the contracts, do, you know, treat them, you know, all as important kind of equally. Yeah. But if we know, no, it's the customer list that they're after, then in that due diligence process and in drafting what we call the representations and warranties, you know, I would really want to have a sit and think about, okay, how do we beef up those in particular? How do we test that they have the customers mm-hmm. that they say they have and that they're meaningful customers? Is there more financial data that we can mm-hmm. get that would be separate in addition to or you know, higher level of detail than what we would yeah. normally get? Is there some way to confirm them? Is there some way I can write the reps and warranties to say, you know, that they promise that these yeah. are what they appear to be. And you know, the th- another thing we often do, whether it's customers, whatever it is, is you know, have some kind of a, mm-hmm. a structure where they don't get paid. You know, there's a holdback maybe. Yeah. They don't get paid the whole amount until you have the company for six months, a year, whatever it is, and make sure that it, it is doing what it's supposed to do. In this case, that those are real customers. They're mm-hmm. not just, you know, people on a list somehow. Yeah. Well, and because the thing that's coming to mind or the mental picture I'm getting is that if you think about due diligence, you, you don't have an infinite amount of time to do due dil- diligence, right? You know, there's usually a specified time period. And even if you have a staff doing due diligence, there's a limit to how much of that you can do. Even if you hire a big four accounting firm to come in and do a, a full top to bottom audit, you can't do a top to bottom audit. And it's usually what, about 60 days of due diligence time in a lot of cases. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's say, you know, so basically the moment you start a deal, you have a timer that's going down for 60 days and you can enhance your impact a little bit by bringing in people, but there's still a limit to what you can do there. So what it's feeling to me like we're saying that you really want to do, which completely makes sense to me, is that you want to say, all right, what are the things that I really care about from this acquisition? And then 
focus your due diligence on really validating those factors because there's always going to be something that isn't quite the way you thought it was going to be. And But what you really want to do with your due diligence is make sure that's not material. Because if the thing that you're buying a company for ends up having a big black eye that you didn't know about, you'll end up paying a lot of money for a big lemon, possibly. So I think, at least to me, that's what I'm really hearing is the important point here. Yeah, absolutely. There's never enough time to do due diligence. You know, mm-hmm. you always feel like it's compressed. And you know, kind of human nature, if you have 60 days, the first 30 days, oftentimes it's not moving as fast as you'd like it. Maybe the other side hasn't given you the information you want yet. Some of that operational due diligence can probably be done before the formal due diligence period. Mm-hmm. That would be great because a lot of the stuff you see there, and then if anything uh, sends up a red flag, you can deal with that in kind of the formal due diligence process, look deeper. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good thing to work together with a client and talk about so that I know what's important to them. Try to think all that through to the extent possible before that clock starts ticking, have a strategy. And you know, knowing at the same time that, okay, if you don't care about the IP and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, we shouldn't be surprised if the IP isn't, you know, what it appeared to be, we we didn't care and focus on if it's the customers or whatever it is. Or another one that I've, uh, it doesn't happen as much now just because uh, values are pretty heavily inflated, but you know, we might start seeing it soon. You know, typically when you get into downturns, you'll have asset purchases, you'll have acquisitions where somebody's figured out essentially the breakup value of the assets is higher than the value of the enterprise. So what they'll do is they'll just essentially buy the company to break it up and then keep some assets and then resell other assets. This was huge in the 80s because, you know, coming off the high inflation, high interest rates time, times the market valuation for a bunch of companies were almost nothing. They were just laughably low. And so that's where the corporate raiders would come in. You know, they'd mm-hmm. buy up the company and then figure out, okay, and then just start selling off the assets to pay for the acquisition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Another reason that we like to do asset purchases is that most of, in theory, all of the liability that might attach to the company mm-hmm. stays with the company, which we're not buying. Whereas, you know, you buy the company, you get everything, including, you know, turns out there's a bunch of angry employees who are getting ready to sue, or former employees, those sorts of things where you just purchase the assets, you can filter in theory, all of that out. In reality, maybe not all of it, but it's certainly beneficial. um, But yeah, that's one of the things we would do to try to structure it or potentially do to limit the risk for- uh, Well, and actually, so this is a, a good distinction to make. So Walk us through the distinction between a purchase of the company and an asset purchase, because they're different kinds mm-hmm. of acquisitions. I think we just hinted at it, but I, I want to make sure that that's a sure. little more clear for the audience. Sure. Yeah. So um, straight out share purchase, you just buy the shares of the company, usually a controlling interest or 100%. And then you get everything. Well, you own the company and it's a separate company owned by you know yeah. whatever entity purchased it. Which you, you is should. not always a wonderful thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay. Both ways have their advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, yes, well, because sure. yeah, when you say you get everything, if there's a lot of debt, if there are mm-hmm. a lot of fulfillment obligations, if there are a lot of warranty obligations, those all now belong to you. Yep. And like I say, things under the surface, you know, the angry employees or mm-hmm. the, you know, the other way to do it, an asset purchase, you don't buy the, the company, you just take the assets out and transfer them over to mm-hmm. your company or oftentimes to a new company you set up just for that purpose. That way is a bit less risky in that sense. You can get rid of some of these hidden liabilities, Mm -hmm. but it tends to be a little bit more tedious. And there's always a a little risk that you know some of the assets will be difficult to transfer over. Yeah, a lot of times when you write a contract or acquire an asset, whatever, you're not really thinking about you know selling it in a few years and transferring it out like that, and that can get involved legally. Yeah, well, um, especially because you know, like if you're talking any kind of real estate asset, it's probably going to be specifically encumbered by a debt obligation. So in that case, mm-hmm. I would imagine if you're moving the asset, you're also going to be moving the liability because that liability is attached to the asset. Yeah, exactly. And the banks, they know all the tricks, obviously. The <laughs> well, this is uh, their game. <laughs> they're, exactly. they're, they literally wrote the rules. <laughs> right. So. Oh, exactly. It's very rare that there'd be a loophole that you could get out of it from yeah. that point of view. Got it. Okay. Let me ask you a question. We've kind of walked through some of the factors in terms of using acquisitions to try to grow your company. Is there a question I should have asked you, but I didn't? The only thing I can think of is if you're going to work with a lawyer in an acquisition, which Mm -hmm. obviously you would be, or anything, I mean, it, it could be the same in litigation, but 
you know, it can be relatively stressful, can be relatively busy, that due diligence period and negotiations, you know, always may be tougher than people expect. Just be comfortable, you know, with the lawyer, comfortable, obviously, with their competence, whatever, however you heard about them, you check up on them, but, but also, you know, someone that you don't mind working with in a kind of stressful environment. And that seems to have their head around this stuff. And that, because I think what we were talking about a minute ago really points to a bigger issue. There oftentimes tends to be a kind of a wall between the mm-hmm. business side and the legal side. And the business side kind of, aside, kind of assumes that, okay, we did the business stuff. And then there's this wall. And then the lawyers do the legal stuff. But actually, the two interrelate. Mm-hmm. So the example you were giving, like, if they tell me, look, we really want the customer list, like, that's, we really care about that. That's really valuable information. You know, and that kind of back and forth lets me do a way better job, I think. Mm-hmm. Then if everyone sees, you know, people oftentimes see the legal work as kind of, I don't know, cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. I think seeing it that way is, I don't want to say a recipe for disaster, but it's not the best way to go. I think that people should see it as a bespoke suit that should fit them, you know, as well as possible, their situation. Well, and okay. I like that analogy, partly because my mother did uh, did custom clothing for a really long time. So one of the things that she would talk about is if you want something to fit right, you know, even if it's the exact right size off the rack. What a lot of people don't know is that, you know, the way that clothes are set up is that, you know, there'll be in big stacks of fabric and there's these industrial cutters that will cut them to size. Well, those industrial cutters don't all go exactly even. So within a particular size and measurement, there's going to be variation. So if you want something to fit just right, even if you buy it from the store, you're still going to have to get it adjusted. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an apt analogy because what we're saying is that, hey, you know, even if you're doing a fairly standard acquisition, it's like, you know, it's not just go to legal zoom, fill in the forms, hit submit, mm-hmm. we're done. Even right. if it's a pretty cut and dried thing, if you want it to fit right, you're going to need to make a few tweaks. Yeah, exactly. I hadn't even thought of that. That's a great analogy. I would extend it also to say that with the clothing analogy, we're all different shapes. Yes. You know, so the <laughs> same size isn't, doesn't necessarily fit you the best. So your particular situation is really important. Yes, precisely. And well, and because of the, again, there's always danger in extending a metaphor too far. But you know, <laughs> the more your particular shape kind of deviates from quote normal or average, I really don't like using those words. But the more outside normal or average you are, the more of an advantage you will get by having something customized versus trying to force fit yourself into something that already exists. Right. Right, exactly. You know, because like the example would be, you know, people who are say taller or shorter than average. Because like for example, my son, just simple, simple example, my son, he's going through a growth spurt. So every set of pants we get for him, it looks like he's waiting for a flood. <laughs> They're yeah. high waters just because his legs are stretching out. And mm-hmm. so the only things we can get that have long enough legs, you know, we have to like put a pin around the waist because it's uh-huh. so big. And so I think that's kind of an apt analogy because it's mm-hmm. like, you know, the legal standards are based around kind of certain set of assumptions. And if you Mm -hmm. perfectly fit those assumptions, you probably don't need a lot of customization. The further out from that quote average or normal, whatever that is anymore, think your company is, the more you'll Mm -hmm. benefit from customizing the work that gets done. Right. Exactly. And also there's the aspect of in terms of the average idea, you know, the average family being, you know, what is it? Two point three kids. Well, yeah, not anymore. No it's one point six now. I was at one point six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. What, what is it? Yeah. Hey, nineteen eighty three just called. <laughs> yeah. I go. But, yeah, you know, we, we've been sailing below replacement rate for a while now. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Scary. But you know, no one actually has a sixth of a kid, so that average suit might not fit almost anybody yeah. perfectly. You know, in a sense, it's all customized. I'm always kind of amazed. You know, every deal I do mm-hmm. at the beginning. It looks like, okay, another one of these, you know, done a bunch of those. You get into it and there's always something, you know, about that particular situation, usually two or three things. Gotcha. All right. Well, hey, Hans, give out your website and uh, let us know where you're uh, most active on social so that people can get a hold of you. Sure. So my website is uh, Sperling, my last name. So S P as in Pennsylvania, E R L I N G, Sperling Law Corp. So law. Corp is incorporation.com. And we'll have the link in, in the show notes. Okay, great. Too. Great. And then I'm most active on LinkedIn. Beautiful. If you look for Hans Sperling, I should pull it up. Outstanding. Excellent. Well, hey, Hans, I really, really appreciate your time today. No, thank you. I really enjoyed talking yeah. with you. A lot of fun. Yeah.
Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. To keep the conversation going, please join the Terminal Value community on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Terminal Value Community and click join. Also, if you like this episode, please leave a review on iTunes or Spotify and make sure to subscribe. When you share it on your favorite social channel, be sure to tag me and tell me what you did or didn't like about the episode so I'll know what to create for you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you and I'll see you again on the next episode.